Good morning. I'm Daniel Kallengart, Executive Vice President of Freedom House, and I want to welcome you here this morning to the launch of Freedom on the Net 2013. Uh, this report has been made possible with support from the Dutch Foreign Ministry, uh, the State Department's uh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and Google. And we are pleased uh, to have not only Google's support for this uh, research, but also for hosting us here this morning. Uh, we don't have to go too far into the headlines to see how topical this issue is, whether we're looking at uh, revelations of surveillance by our own government or events overseas, as in Sudan, which we will be hearing about later in the program. What I think is the great value of this report is to pull together all that information from 60 countries, look at internet freedom in its many dimensions, and try to summarize uh, that picture in a way that's very accessible. Um, you will be shortly hearing a summary of the findings. In fact, the full report, which is available on our website, is about 1,000 pages long. I'd like to uh, thank our uh, Freedom House staff uh, for uh, pulling together this event, particularly Erica Cameron, Jessica Kosmider, Amy Sunkson, Karen Marcus, Liz Lucky, Nina Patel, and Sarah Trister. And I also want to give my personal thanks to Ben Blank at Google for uh, working closely with us uh, to make this all possible. Um, Again, my thanks to Google for its support and for hosting us, and uh, I'll turn right over to Ross Lajeunesse. Ross? Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to, first of all, welcome all of you to Google. It's a really distinct honor to um, welcome His Excellency, the Ambassador of Iceland here, uh, and two very uh, important folks who are on the front lines of fighting for freedom around the world. Google is proud to um, sponsor and support the work of Freedom House on this report and also much more broadly their work around the world to fight for internet freedom. Uh, I have the honor of leading the team at Google that uh, works on free expression and the free and open internet around the world. And we know firsthand just how important the work that Freedom House uh, does is to those efforts. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Sonia uh, up to the podium and she's gonna walk us through the key findings of the 2013 report. Sonia? Good morning. And thank you very much uh, to Google for hosting this event. Before I start, uh, I would like to thank my team, uh, many of whom are actually here, for their tireless work uh, over the year in putting together uh, this report. Uh, Adrian Shabazz, uh, Madeline Earp, Mai Trunk, Laura Reed, and then back in New York, Ashley Greco-Stoner. Um, I believe that right now we are at a critical juncture when it comes to internet freedom. Over one third of the world's population has access to the internet as of today, and that number is going to double by the year 2020. Uh, unfortunately, as more people are accessing the internet and using various tools to communicate, uh, to press their governments for positive change, to conduct business and so forth, the governments are also noticing the power of this new medium, and they're introducing new laws and new measures to censor it. One of the key findings for this year is that internet freedom has been on decline for the third year straight as we have been tracking it by this project. And this decline uh, has been in great part because of a worldwide increase in surveillance as well as in the increase of new laws that have a potentially negative impact on internet freedom, as well as the increase of number of people who are being arrested uh, around the world for things that they post online. And again, we're not speaking here about just political activists, for pe people who are pushing for political reform in, in, in these countries, but we are actually talking about everyday people, such as housewives and students, uh, who are just posting things on Facebook and Twitter and getting into legal trouble uh, because of it. 
Given this proliferation of uh, new laws that we are seeing around the world, I believe that we are at a critical juncture uh, when it comes to the internet. And the future of the internet is being decided as we speak. I'm not talking about even uh, internet governance issues on the global scale and some of the threats that we are seeing coming from the uh, ITU and uh, other institutions, but I'm talking about national legislation in the countries, uh, many of whom are putting additional restrictions online. And depending on what happens on the national level, uh, the internet might be balkanized, or I hope that we are going to be able to push back and keep the internet free and relatively unrestricted. Uh, before I go into some of the key findings from this report, I would like to tell you a little bit more about it. So uh, we are covering 60 countries this year, and this is a relatively new project, and we have been increasing country coverage each year. At this point, we are still not able to cover the entire world, but we hope to get there. Uh, it is an annual report that consists of two parts. Uh, one is actually a chapter for each country. So each of the 60 countries has a detailed analysis of various aspects of internet freedom. And then the second part are actually quantitative ratings. And this is something that Freedom House is famous for. We actually grade each country based on their level of internet freedom. Considering that this is an annual project, we're focusing this year on developments between May 2012 and April of this year. However, in few instances, uh, such as in the instance of the United States, we have decided to include some of the developments that were revealed after the ca coverage period because uh, some of the revelations actually impacted internet freedom during the coverage period. Uh, one of the key reasons why it's very helpful to have uh, Freedom on the Net and an annual survey is because we apply the same methodology to these countries year after year. So not only are we able to actually assess them based on the same set of criteria, but we're able to track policy improvements and declines uh, every year. Uh, although I mentioned my team uh, in New York, and uh, we are a very small team, uh, the majority of this work is actually being done uh, in cooperation with over 70 researchers who are in the field. So they're the ones who actually test availability of websites, who look at laws and procedures, uh, they look and track the number of people arrested uh, or attacked and so forth. And most of them are local scholars, attorneys, internet freedom activists, uh, and bloggers. Uh, considering that we often get a lot of questions about our methodology, I will uh, tell you just very briefly about it. So our methodology actually uh, takes a very holistic approach of internet freedom. So I know when a lot of people think about internet freedom, they th think automatically about blocking and filtering and perhaps surveillance. But there is a whole set of issues that encompasses this concept. And uh, we have actually created methodology that looks at 21 main questions and then over uh, 100 sub-questions that we then group into three main categories. The first one examining obstacles to access, so issues ranging from in infrastructural and economic barriers to access, uh, general business environment and regulatory environment um, uh, impacting uh, businesses that provide the internet, ownership control over ISPs, then the regulatory agencies that control ICTs and so forth. Then the second area that uh, we look at is what we label as controls on content. So that area actually encompasses a wide set of issues such as blocking and filtering. So we, for example, look, la look at how many websites are being blocked, what's the nature of those websites, uh, and so forth. We also look at the technologies that some of these governments implement uh, to restrict uh, content uh, and so forth. We look at the laws that control content, then also issues such as intermediary liability, forced deletions, uh, also laws that impact uh, news media, uh, specifically online and so forth. And then the third area that we focus on is violations of user rights. So there we actually look at a whole, whole series of questions related to surveillance, legal protections for free speech, the number of people who are being arrested or the number of people who are being uh, attacked physically uh, or verbally, and uh, issues such as cyber attacks. Uh, but cyber attacks particularly focused uh, at uh, in independent news media and human rights activists. 
after uh, we scored each country uh, based on this wide set of indicators, we come up with the ranking of countries. So uh, what you see on the screen is actually very small, but you can actually uh, see it in the copy of the summary of the findings uh, that you got at your chair. So based on the findings this year, some of the countries that came at the top of the scale are places like Iceland, Estonia, Germany, United States. United States did suffer a pretty significant decline in our ratings. Uh, however, given that surveillance is only one aspect of the broader internet freedom issue, it still did retain uh, its ranking within the top five countries that we examined. Uh, among the worst performers are places like Iran, Cuba, China, Syria, and Ethiopia, where information is not only blocked, but people who uh, write things online are being systematically arrested, uh, imprisoned, sometimes they're tortured or murdered. Uh, as you will also see on the screen and on the book, in the booklet, uh, we then uh, compile all of the countries into free, partly free, and not free categories. But even within those categories, each country receives a score, uh, meaning that not every country within the free category receives uh, the same level or has the same level of internet freedom. And even the best performer does not receive the best score. One of the things that really stood out when we examined all of the countries uh, is that, as I mentioned, internet freedom has been dec in decline. And out of 60 countries that we examined, 34 have registered a negative trajectory. One of the things that really stood out to me is that unlike in the past, where many countries who were some of the worst performers and some of the most repressive in the countries were among the ones who were actually going down in terms of their performance, we are actually seeing more and more democracies uh, also unfortunately uh, starting to implement poor policies. So among uh, the countries that declined the worst this year, uh, in addition to of course places like Vietnam and China, which have long time ago instituted some strict controls, also places like India and Brazil and then the United States in large part, but not exclusively because of the surveillance issues. Uh, India is really an interesting case, it being the largest democracy. Uh, however, the number of arrests in India over the past year has skyrocketed, particularly of social media users. And then a whole range of issues, whether that be content deletions or the blocking of material during the unrest or disabling of ICT technologies during uh, some of these more challenging uh, times of uh, social uh, unrest uh, were among the key reasons for its decline. In Brazil, also, a very interesting situation. It's a country that has uh, very strict electoral laws. And as a result of the elections uh, last year, municipal elections, we've seen such a dramatic increase in the number of takedown requests uh, of some of the content related to the elections. We've also seen an increase uh, in terms of uh, bloggers being harassed including a case of a blogger being killed. Uh, issues of intermediary liability also being a prominent case are just a few among the reasons for this decline. Uh, this project itself this year identifies 10 most common internet controls uh, that we have noticed uh, over the previous year. And uh, as you will see, uh, there are many of them, meaning that many of the governments really have a diverse toolbox from which they can pick which kind of controls they want to implement. So one thing is, of course, blocking and filtering. And as I mentioned, we not only looked at uh, uh, the number of websites, but we looked at particular content. And what we've seen is that in 29 out of 60 countries that we examined, the government had implemented blocking or filtering, particularly focused on either political, social, or, or religious content. Uh, some of the other issues included restrictive laws and arrests or paid pro-government commentators. Also a very dramatic increase in physical attacks. And we will hear in a moment from uh, my colleague from Mexico who, who can tell you coming from a place where actually a number of journalists uh, who work specifically for online outlets as well as bloggers were killed in Mexico, uh, not by the government, but uh, very often these crimes are perpetrated by the criminal underworld. Syria this year was uh, the most dangerous place for citizen journalists, with about 20 people killed over the past year alone. 
uh, for something specific that they posted online, very often revealing human rights abuses. Uh, issues such as uh, broad intermediary liability uh, are a huge problem, and over the past year uh, alone, we identified at least 25 countries where intermediaries uh, were, were held disproportionately liable for the content uh, that was being posted through their services. Uh, for most of these controls, you can actually uh, read the details on our website, but for the sake of time and for the sake of the challenge of summarizing this 1,000 page uh, book, I'm going to focus only on three uh, main issues that are of particular concern. So one being gr growing surveillance. Uh, the entire international community is currently being focused at the United States, and for some uh, very serious and justifi justifiable reasons. However, we see growing surveillance being part of the worldwide trend. In fact, in 35 countries out of 60 countries uh, that we examined, we've seen increased uh, surveillance, whether that be through new laws that are being passed or through uh, new technological cap capacity. And, uh, I have identified these 35 countries because this is where surveillance has been increased over the past year alone. And uh, quite frankly, in the remaining 25 countries, uh, there is a strong suspicion that they have also beefed up their security measures. However, they might be a bit better at uh, covering their tracks. Russia has emerged as an important incubator of surveillance technologies and legal practices that are being emulated by other former Soviet republics. So we have seen um, similar surveillance uh, systems that are used in Russia increasingly being implemented uh, in places like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, and so forth. And uh, Russia itself has really increased uh, its surveillance practices, particularly since the Arab Spring. Uh, in fact, one particular legal case has had a particularly chilling effect in the Russian context. And that is last year when the Russian Supreme Court actually upheld the hacking into a phone of an activist uh, on the grounds that this activist participated in opposition rallies. So obviously this really set an extremely worrisome precedent for other people who work on human rights and political issues there. Among uh, 10 African countries in our sample, we've actually seen all 10 of them increase uh, surveillance. Again, whether that be through new laws or uh, through new technologies. And uh, part of this is that many of African countries are now just catching up because internet penetration is growing uh, in that part of the world. But then part of it is uh, just availability of some of these monitoring technologies on the market and the ease with which these uh, governments can obtain it. In the Middle East and North Africa, which uh, has had uh, pervasive surveillance through a number of years, we've actually seen additional steps uh, by these governments. So for example, in S Saudi Arabia, which already has a very sophisticated surveillance apparatus, we've actually seen the government proactively recruiting experts to work on intercepting encrypted data. Uh, in Egypt, uh, before the fall of Morsi government, uh, we actually saw some of his top advisors meet with Iranian experts, with, so with Iranian top spy chief, because the office of the president actually wanted to build a separate surveillance apparatus to uh, what, what already existed within the military structures. The second issue that I would like to highlight is just this proliferation of new laws to restrict online speech. And uh, over the past year alone, we actually saw in 24 out of 60 countries that we evaluated a new law or a directive that negatively impact internet freedom. So in many of these countries, uh, these restrictive laws are often disguised as cybersecurity or anti-terrorism legislation. But in practice, they're so broad that they can be used as some of these governments see fit, or they themselves actually have uh, very unique provisions that found their way into what is, what is supposed to be a bill that combats issues such as money laundering and so forth. So in the countries such as the United Arab Emirates, we've seen a cybersecurity legislation uh, being uh, embraced and passed last year. And this cybersecurity legislation uh, looks 
at issues such as cybercrime, uh, sales of illegal drugs online, and so forth. But then it also has specific provisions that criminalizes any criticism uh, of the authorities. In fact, it prescribes life imprisonment for anyone who actually calls for regime change uh, in their country. We'll, we, we have also seen the strengthening of the laws in Ethiopia, also its anti-terrorism legislation. And again, this legislation uh, has some provisions that are perhaps legitimate and they deal with uh, terrorism. However, uh, what happens in Ethiopia is that the laws are so broad that we've actually seen bloggers being sentenced to 18 year, years in prison because uh, they wrote something uh, against the regime on the internet. Uh, very often, and this is something that we've particularly seen over the past year, is that uh, there are many countries that are trying to pass laws aimed at limiting information, what they label as extremist, blasphemous, harmful uh, to children, and so forth. And again, as with my previous point, very often what we see is that those laws are just too broad, as for example, uh, what is the case in Russia, and then as a result, we see websites of opposition politicians or human rights organizations being blocked as a result. One of the interesting points when it comes to these uh, emerging legal structures is that we are seeing an increasing number of governments actually putting additional limitations on online media. And the reason why I'm particularly worried about this is because in many of these authoritarian settings, it's actually the online media that is able to provide independent points of view because all of the traditional media is being controlled by the government. What we are seeing more and more now is that governments are imposing uh, regulations that uh, requires all of e uh, these news websites to, to register with the government, and then uh, the government has sometimes the authority to even appoint the editor-in-chief. We've seen some of that legislation in places, places like Jordan, uh, which, for example, last year passed a similar law, and they provided a one-year, essentially, a buffer period for all of these online news websites to register. And then, just a few months ago, when the websites uh, did not register, or those websites uh, who didn't, uh, then those websites were being blocked. We've seen sim similar things in Sri Lanka and several other places over the past year alone. As a result of all of these new laws, we are seeing more and more people being arrested for the things that they say online. And in 28 out of the 60 countries that we assessed, a user was arrested or imprisoned for posting something of political, social, or religious nature uh, online. And uh, I really do want to stress this point that more and more of people who are being affected by this are really everyday users who will post things online not really realizing that what they just posted may actually get them into a prison or actually put them in harm's way. Uh, so to give you a few examples for uh, the things that people were arrested over the previous year, I think uh, the first thing in my mind is uh, an example from India where a woman complained online because of the shutdowns in Mumbai uh, because of the funeral uh, of a local dignitary. And she was arrested for posting that on Facebook. Then after that, her friend liked her post on Facebook. And the friend was arrested, too, just for liking the post. In Ethiopia, for example, uh, a student was criticized, uh, or a student was arrested because he posted on Facebook a comment uh, saying that uh, there was a corruption at a local university. Or in uh, Bahrain, at least 10 users uh, were arrested, and some of them receiving a prison sentence under the official charge of criticizing or insulting the uh, King on Twitter. In Morocco, we've also seen a number of users being arrested for things that they posted uh, on Facebook, or even a rapper uh, receiving a prison sentence for a video of a song that he uploaded uh, on YouTube. 
Uh, we're also seeing in more and more countries that the authorities are being less tolerant of humor. So it's not only criticism uh, of the authorities that's straightforward that can actually land people into trouble, but also jokes that might be perceived as offensive is something for which people get arrested. Uh, one interesting example for me is uh, from Turkey, and a prominent composer actually posted on Twitter essentially a joke saying that the reason why uh, the call for prayer lasts only 20 seconds is because the religious authorities need to go back to their drinking and their mistresses. Let's just say that the authorities did not take this well, so he was arrested and he was charged for uh, inciting religious discord. Likewise, in India, we've actually seen people get arrested for cartoons that they uh, post online. And I will show you one of them. So a cartoonist uh, on his website, uh, Cartoons Against Corruption, uh, posted a series of cartoons that depicted the parliament uh, in the sense of the national toilet. And again, the authorities did not take that well. Guess what? He was arrested as well. And I know that the picture that I'm painting is quite negative. And there are many, many reasons to be concerned because uh, as we have been tracking this from year to year, we are just really seeing uh, the rapid movement and the response by some of these authorities when it comes to free speech online. But then at the same time, we're seeing a growing pushback, whether that be by civil society or uh, by the technology companies or others within uh, the society against some of these repressive measures. Um, as a positive sign, in several countries, we've actually seen a negative law being deterred or positive law being passed as a result of this civic mobilization. Uh, right now, I really do not want to overstate uh, the effect of this because just looking in the global perspective, the number of governments and the number of countries where new restrictions were put in place by far outnumbers uh, the number of these um, uh, pushbacks and victories. However, the emergence of and strengthening of this movement to protect internet freedom is a really important development, and I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. One of the things that we noticed is that the pushback works the best uh, when there is a strong and broad coalition of civil society with the technology sector and perhaps with a reform-minded politician in the country. And if they're able to come together and then put the pressure on the government, the likelihood of such negative legislation uh, is uh, to be deterred uh, is much higher. Several examples of this uh, positive pushback from the previous year includes the Philippines, where uh, the Cybercrime Prevention Act was suspended by the Supreme Court, but this really came as a result first as uh, a great mobilization by civil society and then people actually filing petitions with the Supreme Court and then the Supreme Court finally reviewing the new law. Or in Kyrgyzstan, when the government wanted to pass a new law that was uh, very similar to what Russia passed recently on protection of children, but again, which had been used for uh, other purposes as well, more nefarious purposes, civil society pushed back and the government shelved this plan. Uh, one of the uh, favorite examples of mine for this past peri uh, coverage period actually comes from Mexico, and we will hear from my colleague here in a few minutes. But in Mexico, actually a group of civil society organization uh, was able to come together and push for a constitutional amendment that guarantees freedom of access to the internet. And actually this provision is now included in the Article 6 of the Mex Mexican Constitution. Uh, although the government uh, hasn't yet acted because this is a uh, pre-recent uh, development. So the government has not yet acted in terms of passing uh, a follow-up legislation that would really clarify how this new uh, uh, right would be uh, translated into practice. It's nevertheless a very important development which really showcases uh, what uh, civic activism can do. And then, of course, we've seen ICTs becoming an important tool for mobilization, not just for the purposes of pushing for internet freedom policy, but from other aspects uh, of uh, democracy and human rights. So we've actually seen 
activists successfully using online tools to reveal corruption, to fight for women's rights, to for, uh, fight for greater uh, environmental rights, and so forth. And many ex examples are there, even from some of the most authoritarian states, uh, including China. Um, I just want to conclude by saying that, uh, again, I do feel like that right now the history of the internet is in our hands. And just given the proliferation of these new laws, particularly on the national level, I really think that this is the time to act because if more and more governments continue passing this negative legislation, uh, we are going to find ourselves in a very worrisome spot just five years from now. But uh, at the same time, it's very important to actually support this civil society movement because we have seen that in many places they are starting to make difference. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia, for that uh, summary of a very dense report and making it very accessible. Uh, as we heard, Iceland received the highest ratings among the 60 countries, and uh, we are delighted to have the ambassador of Iceland here with us this morning, uh, Mr. Gudmundar Arne Stefansson, and uh, we'd really like to hear from you. Uh, what has made Iceland such a model uh, for internet freedom? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Freedom House, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Island nation like Iceland is, are, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about communications. The ocean can provide uh, defense, but it also provides a clear division from neighboring states. How island nations deal with this separation often defines their character and identity. We Icelanders are originally a nation of seafarers. Uh, their, our ancestors a millennia ago did not feel apart from the rest of the world. We know how they sailed, raided and traded extensively across Europe and all the way to the now is the Northeast United States. The character is evident in Iceland today. Iceland, is, Iceland Air carries more passengers between Northern Europe and North America than any other airline. We trade with our friends and neighbors both to the east and to the west. But over the last two decades, we have seen our relationship with the world fundamentally transformed thanks to the internet. In addition to our existing links with the outside world, the, the instant communication of the internet has not only brought us closer to the world, it has erased the separation that the ocean creates. The internet is therefore something we have embraced, something we cherish. It is not surprised it's no surprise that the 96% of the Icelanders are internet users compared with 81% in the US. The government places, places no restriction on the use of internet. It is an unregulated communication network. Of course, all online activity is subject to the same laws and regulations that govern our daily lives. Therefore, the courts and law, law enforcement Agencies are involved in cases where the crimes are committed or when individuals want to seek legal resource, such as in case of alleged libel. Additionally, the Icelandic Data Protection Authority is the official body that works to ensure the privacy of citizens' personal information. As a result of this fundamental openness and freedom, the internet in Iceland, like many other places, has become an active forum for debate, social organizations, grassroots activism, and increasingly of engagement with government. Most of these have grown originally with the use of social media, online newspapers and blogs, and etc. However, the government engagement piece requires more proactive efforts for the authorities in addition to simply providing the platform for communication that is the internet. 
As it turns out, despite the high rate of internet use by Icelanders, the government has lagged behind in recent years in offering citizens online access to government services. This one, this one could argue, is a significant part of online freedom. And it is an issue that we have looked carefully and uh, are determined to change in coming years. Don't get me wrong, Iceland still ranks quite high globally. The United, Mes United Nations measure e-government places Iceland in 22nd place, while the US is in 5th. This shows that we have work to do in order to offer more services online. It is, however, clear that there is a great appetite for such services in, in the population. Iceland is ranked first in the world among users of online government services. Similarly, a World Economic Forum survey, the Network Readiness Index, gave Iceland, big high, gave Iceland high scores for N network uh, infrastructure and individually readiness, but low for business and government usage. This is therefore mostly a problem of supply and not of demand. A key task for the future is therefore to safeguard the openness of the internet as a platform for communications and engagement. We feel we are where we need to be in that respect, and I'm pleased to note that the high freedom on the net ranking Iceland is giving by the Freedom House. We cannot rest on our laurels, however, and we see this as an ongoing project to safeguard the openness of the internet, while at the same time ensuring that it does not become a haven for lawbreakers. Furthermore, we face the task of climbing the e-government rankings and offering more online government services to our public. To this end, the government has impl implementing a four-year policy from 2013 to 2016. It was drawn up by the state in cooperation with the municipalities, as well as through broad outreach with stakeholders, both private and public. We look forward to continued engagement with Freedom House on the su subject of uh, internet freedom and hope that uh, as we implement our four-year policy that perhaps Iceland, by virtue of its internet penetration and growth of online services, can be a model for others to emulate. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Stefansson. I now have the great honor and pleasure of introducing Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, who has uh, grappled with internet issues for many years in the Senate and before that in the House of Representatives. And uh, I particularly want to pay tribute to his leadership of the uh, Congressional Executive Commission on China, which has focused heavily on issues of internet censorship, and held hearings on the impact of this censorship on human rights and trade, and also more recently looked at the issue of Chinese hacking and how that has affected human rights and commercial rule of law. Uh, we very much look forward to your views on the current state of internet freedom. Senator Brown. Dan, thank you, Ambassador. I enjoyed your words and congratulations, and thank you for being a beacon for the rest of the world to follow. Uh, and Sonia, thank you for your terrific work on this, the sophistication of this report, the, the 70 researchers who uh, took part in this impressive project. Um, we so appreciate. Uh, the, I think it's important to think for a moment about the, the history of Freedom House and sort of how it came about some 72 or three years ago in 1941, uh, in part in a response to Axis Nazi broadcasts uh, and, and Freedom House was founded by, by Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie to in part respond to that and the, the interesting kind of metaphoric bookends of, of dealing with Nazi broadcasts and, and Orwellian, although it wouldn't have been called that then, of course, uh, doublespeak or newspeak or whatever evolved into what, what we've seen so many times in China. We know that uh, China ranks next to the last ahead of only Iran in, in f according to these, these rankings that Sonia and the information that she gathered. Um, some of you, how many of you have seen the movie Lincoln? I assume a number of you have, okay. 
Um, Lincoln, uh, they, he didn't do a lot on the internet, but Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln was, at, in the movie Lincoln, there's a one, I, I didn't see this, my, my wife and I actually watched it three times because we're really nerds, but the set, we didn't see this the first time, we only noticed this the second time. Lincoln is talking, his staff has, has implored him repeatedly to spend his time in the White House uh, winning the war, freeing the slaves, saving the Union. And Lincoln keeps pushing back, wanting to go and meet people. He says, I need my public opinion baths. And Lincoln apparently, I actually talked to Doris Kearns Goodwin and asked her about the historical view. She, she, Lincoln apparently would, would say that from time to time, that he needed his public opinion baths. And I, I think when you look at what Freedom House stands for, and you look at um, those of us, and I would include probably everybody in this room, that, that care about freedom and care about uh, internet freedom and, and, and civil rights and human rights and and, and freedom of speech, uh, it's important to think about public officials exposed to those public opinion baths. And uh, I, I would argue that not enough public officials in our country, I think one of the reasons, I'm not gonna make a big deal of this, but one of the reasons for the government shutdown is that too many people in Congress don't spend enough time talking to real people about real issues that affect their, their real daily lives. But um, I think that, that what, what, what Freedom House has done, what this report has done, um, kind of plays into that about the importance of what's happened in China and what, what we can learn in our country. We, we rank high we don't rank as high as Iceland we rank high in this country we're proud of that but it's but it's always a challenge I want to talk for a moment about the Congressional Executive Commission on China it's a bipartisan effort uh, Larry here is the director of it uh, Larry Liu and he's put your hand up and assisted by Doug, Doug Babcock in our office um, and we've we've benefited from your research um, over the years, and many of our findings echo yours. We are about to issue a report. Um, we we will likely still issue the report, I believe, next week. Um, but we were planning on a hearing next week, but because of the what I think is a senseless government shutdown, we're we're not going to do that hearing yet until the government until everybody's back to work. Uh, China's, as you know, China by. What it's done with the internet is blocked unflattering reports, has manipulated online discussion. And it's not just an expression, it's not just really an issue of free expression, it's a fair trade and a global health issue. You may remember a dozen years or so ago, there was a terrible earthquake in Taiwan because Taiwan to the world community is considered part of China. The world community didn't come in and help Taiwan until China 24 hours later said it could. Uh, you know about the blocking of information about SARS. And so that's a public health issue and we know it's it's a free trade issue. We know that the the the, the work, the the interaction that the United States has with China, um, and, and and the role of U.S. corporations has has been pretty uneven at best. I mean, the the much of the wealth created in China has come from U.S. companies who put uh, who put um, their bottom line ahead of any kind of political freedom. Um, and I think it's important always when we remember, uh, talk about freedom in China, talk about human rights, talk about the way workers are, are treated in China, that sometimes there's a significant responsibility that we as a nation share because of our trade policy and our tax policy and our corporations that, um, that do business there in a way that sometimes comes back on us in terms of contaminated pharmaceuticals, in terms of unfair trade companies, Competition and the morality of the way that, that far too many workers in China subcontracted from U.S. corporations, not letting the Chinese off the hook for a second on this, but, but what that all means to them. So I think that U.S. companies should think long and hard about their involvement in China, especially because of, of that checkered past. Um, the, these reports, I want to say something about your report and our report, that these reports serve us a very significant and vital public function. When repressive governments try to rewrite history and try to mask their abuses, there must be others to call them out. And that really is the significance of today, of your report, of our report, of everybody in this, the activism of people in this crowd. When ordinary citizens and activists like Chinese Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, Leo Xiaobo uh, risk their lives for freedom and justice, they need to know they're not alone. One of the things I've learned as chair, as co-chair of this commission, and that Larry's taught me and the witnesses have taught me, is that it's important that Americans speak out 
when someone is, is imprisoned or worse in China because they don't know that the world's looking out for them. And we have seen, we can document case after case where the American government speaking out, individual politicians speaking out, and more importantly, a bunch of, a bunch of activists in our country who care about human rights or in Iceland or anywhere else around the world um, speak out. It does, in fact, in most cases, help, help those activists. Uh, in, in information education are the building blocks of change. It's going to be a long road. The task of gathering information case by case and law by law as you've done so well is essential to understanding and identifying and stopping human rights abuses which in, in whatever country they occur. Without it, government and the public remain in the dark and cannot make the kinds of decisions about policies that we should. Um, I look forward to sharing your information, Sonia, that you've gathered. Again, thank you uh, with members of Congress. We will issue our report next week. We will do a hearing soon after that to continue to shed light on a very, very, very important issue. So thank you all for your activism. Thank you very much, Senator Brown, for uh, sharing your thoughts and for your ongoing leadership on human rights issues in China and more broadly. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite the panelists to come up and take their seats. And I will uh, introduce our moderator for the discussion this morning, uh, Peter Cook. Uh, Peter Cook is Bloomberg Television's chief Washington correspondent and the host of Capital Gains, which airs on Bloomberg Television on Sundays. Uh, he covers the intersection of business and government, uh, most recently the uh, lack of government in Washington. Uh, and we are delighted to have you here. He uh, moderated uh, the panel discussion last year for the launch of Freedom on the Net 2012, and we're delighted to have you back. Thanks so much, Peter. Over to you. Thank you very much. Happy to be back for the second straight year for this important conversation. I want to welcome our panelists. I'll introduce them in just a moment. I want to welcome all of you here. In addition, uh, this is an important topic for me as a journalist here in Washington, a big important topic for Bloomberg as an international news organization trying to get as much information and news out to as many people as possible around the world. And it's obviously a timely topic here in Washington these days, not only the issues about surveillance, but as we just heard about the shutdown right now, there's uh, the agency most responsible for expanding internet access in this country is the FCC. And I was told last night 98% of the staff is on furlough. So if any of you are from the FCC on furlough, welcome. I uh, look forward to your questions as, uh, as well. But uh, I'm going to start the conversation, and then we're going to expand it out to those of you in the audience. I know you all will have undoubtedly better questions than I have for our panelists. But let me introduce them quickly. Sonia, you know already the project director for Freedom House. And we have also to my left Jorge Luis Sierra. He's an award-winning Mexican investigative journalist and editor. He's written extensively about drug trafficking and organized crime. And he's currently a fellow at the International Center for Journalists. Welcome, Jorge. We have uh, Daya Haj Omar. She's a Sudanese human rights activist and a member of Garifna, a youth movement that promotes peaceful civic engagement in Sudan. Can give us a first-hand uh, impression about what's happening in Sudan. And on the end, Ross Lajeunesse of Google. He gets the uh, job as global head of free enterprise and international relations at Google in selling the idea of an open internet and free expression around the world on behalf of the company. No small task indeed. Ross, welcome as well. And thanks again for, for having us all here. Let me start, Dahlia, if I could, with you. Uh, I'd like to hear your view of a first-hand account, the real world view of, of these issues in a country like Sudan right now, where just last week, the internet was cut off. Yeah. Give us a sense what it's really like on the ground there. Well, this is very timely for us uh, in Sudan, an event like this where I can come and speak to an international audience about the, the protests going on right now in Sudan, uh, triggered mainly by the government's decision to lift uh, gasoline and fuel and, and basic subsidies of a country that's already extremely impoverished. And the reaction were nationwide protests, uh, but this time very different than the ones hap that happened last year because there were um, geographic sp scope was gr gr very big, participation of the population was very big, and the reaction of the government was extremely violent, and citizens basically started documenting these reactions, v videos, very graphic photographs, uh, and I think this really shocked the government of Sudan. They thought that they could hide this like they hide um, the conflict in Darfur, for instance, where 
The citizens of urban centers never get to see the graphic uh, violations of, of the government, uh, or the Nuba Mountains, where also there's a new war right now. Um, so I think the reaction of shutting down the internet was this, I don't think they ever thought that citizens can have a voice. Um, they've closed down all local newspapers that were talking about these um, uh, protests and the economic situation. They've kicked out two international satellite uh, television, uh, uh, television channels that were covering the, uh, the protests. Uh, but now they, they forgot that this is the age where governments cannot hide anything anymore. Um, How are activists, if possible, getting around these kinds of limitations? Um, well, for the very first time, uh, the government of Sudan last year, during Sudan revolts, the summer of last year, started cracking down on digital activists um, and video bloggers, etc. We don't have a history of this. Uh, I think um, it's, uh, we've had experiences for, uh, just from last year where uh, digital, digital activists were imprisoned for up to two months for just posting uh, a YouTube video. Uh, Sudan's most prominent um, video blogger, Najla Asid Ahmed, right now is in exile in Uganda since last year because of threats to her and her family. Um, we've had uh, the most prominent um, uh, uh, woman from the Nuba Mountains who, who was a, a detainee last year um, was in prison for about 10 months because she had, uh, she had a testimony on YouTube talking about what's happening in the Nuba Mountains in terms of the government's uh, shelling of citizens. Um, so it's, and, and when she was finally given a trial, the YouTube video was the only evidence uh, in her court case. Um, so I think th this is just a glimpse of how it's repressive in terms of just ex like expression on the internet, freedom of expression, but it's only a reflection of, a, of how it is really on the ground offline as well. Um, our, our offline media has also uh, been very restricted since the separation of South Sudan with a lot of journalists banned from writing, imprisoned, a lot of newspapers closing, extreme censorship, and this is slowly creeping to the online world as well. Or hey, let me uh, ask you to give us, again, your real world perspective from Mexico, from Panama, other countries uh, where you've been working. What's the real effect here on online journalists, anyone, activists, not only in Mexico is it the government, but it's also organized crime that's uh, cracking down here? Oh, yes, yes of course. Um, um, there is a current trend in Mexico and as well and in other uh, countries in Central America that the online journalists are uh, under attack. Uh, mostly from organized crime organizations. As, as you know, some uh, organized crimes based in Mexico are going south, are going to, to Central America, and they are trying to take control on different communities or along Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, even Panama. So, so the, the online uh, journalists are facing this, this, this issue in a very heavy way. Uh, over the last two years, um, about five online journalists have been killed in Mexico, and, uh, and they have suffered um, the threats. We, we conducted a survey in, in Mexico among 102 journalists, uh, both online and offline in Mexico, and 70% of those journalists said they were attacked or threatened, 70%. So it's a big, big, big number. Uh, but the good news is that we are providing training uh, in digital and mobile security tools in order to reduce risk. And now uh, you are going to see citizens equipped um, uh, with um, digital security tools, protecting their cell phones, protecting, encrypting their communications, trying to, to, to have encryption in the everyday, everyday communication with editors and, um, and citizens. And uh, I think over the last uh, 10 months, um, no, no, no online uh, trained by us has been killed or has been um, arrested. Um, and we think this is because of the training. So the training in this part is a huge, a huge uh, has possibility. It, has it had a chilling effect, though? Do you know people who were active as online journalists who just said, listen, I, I can't risk my life, my family's safety. Um, yes, of course. I can't do this anymore. Um, yes, of course. Yes, of course. It's several times. I think uh, uh, I, I've been training. I've been training four Twitter users in in the northern part of Tamaulipas, in the border with Texas, and uh, and they said, okay, the last time 
uh, Twitter user were killed. It was in um, 2010, in October 2010, the, uh, when three people were killed uh, by the drug traffickers. And since then, they are actively protecting themselves with um, um, security tool, security tools, and uh, learning a lot. Uh, uh, so we put together those those Twitter users, and then we uh, launched a program called Cobertura Segura in Guadalajara City. So we put together journalists and Twitter users to learn uh, digital security tools. So when they uh, got back to, to the community, they started to disseminate all the learnings among the uh, Twitter community in, in those cities. And it was a, a, a big, a big um, success in, in Mexico. So we have bad news, but we have also good news. Ross, let me ask you, uh, as you hear this report, see the findings of this report, the number of countries where apparently this internet freedom has been diminished uh, up this year, as a company that has to do business or wants to do business in all of these uh, countries, wants to promote free expression, internet freedom, this is a difficult balancing act. When you walk into these government offices, say, hi, I'm the guy from Google, uh, what sort of reception are you getting right now these days? And talk to us about instances where you've had success in terms of getting governments to push the limits that they've placed, and maybe instances where you haven't. Right. Um, I think the first thing to note is that often uh, in those situations, we recognize that our going into that government isn't actually the smartest way of effectuating change. It's one of the reasons why we support Freedom House and activists all around the world is because of this recognition that uh, for many local governments, what is most persuasive to them are local civic uh, groups coming in, local businesses going into those governments and articulating the, the message that we want delivered, which is the internet is going to be the primary driver of economic development in this country. You have a choice. Do you want to be part of that or do you not want to be part of that? And an American company coming in, especially Google, where you know we've taken stances in China and elsewhere around the world, Google going in is often counterproductive, so we recognize that and, and we try and uh, operate in a way that's smart. It, we also recognize that uh, in certain parts of the world, we do have a powerful voice. Uh, many parts of Southeast Asia and many parts of the world where economic development is the key priority, it can be powerful for an American company to come in and articulate that same message. Do you, you, you care about economic growth? That only happens in this world uh, through the internet. And it only happens through a free and open internet. Uh, you know, we, we have this view in many parts of the world that just give us the internet and everything's gonna be fine. And what we need to articulate is that that's not really true. It's only the free and open internet that provides for the innovation, the creativity, the entrepreneurship, the social and civic engagement, which in turn leads to not only economic development, but societal advancement and connectivity with the rest of the world. And I think one of the, one of the things that we're focused on is bringing more companies to the table in, in articulating that argument. The reality is that every company today is an internet company. Right? Let's take Audi car company, right? You can't source materials, you can't reach new customers, you can't market your products. Your employees can't even speak to one another, really, without using the internet. And yet, when we face these battles around the world, the internet goes down or there are blockages, far too few companies consider themselves internet companies and engage in that battle. So I see that one of, as one of our primary challenges is to, is to get the rest of the world, the rest of businesses around the world, uh, engaged in this battle. What goes through your mind when you hear the example of uh, an activist using a, a YouTube post and that was the single piece of evidence used against her in Sudan? Well, I think part of the work that we do is also <clears throat> we recognize that our, that our platforms and our tools are used around the world for free expression and political activism. And we, we, we work very hard to educate users about both the risks and the rewards of doing that. We have online security training that we provide to users uh, and activists in particular that we maintain relationships with. And it's, and it's a constant struggle. You know, it really is a cat and mouse sort of game because 
we need to educate our users while not educating governments and, 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 and repressive regimes about those same tools. I mean, we, we, you know, in, we work very hard on encryption. Most of, you know, most of our communications, our Gmail is encrypted. But at the same time that you want to let users know that, you want to let them know that they need to be smart about how they use Gmail, for example. That encryption isn't 100% uh, guarantee that they're going to be safe. So we, we see that as part of our mandate is to educate users and especially activists around the world about the risks involved with using these platforms as well. Sonia, I want to get you in, involved here. How about the technology argument? Are the, is the online community going to be able to ta stay a step ahead of governments or is it, is it the other way around these days? Uh, well, it's really the game of cat and mouse. So we are definitely seeing uh, the technology progressing and we're seeing uh, both activists and then also tech firms coming up with innovative tools to push boundaries. Uh, whether that be when it comes to uh, everyday duties and tasks to really political activism. When I speak with people like Dahlia and others who really work to reform their governments from within by using some of these tools, I'm always amazed with different ideas that they're, they're able to come up. But it seems like that the government is always lurking from behind. So then we really often see essentially a push in activism and then the following year uh, constricting of this uh, online space. I think the use of circumvention tools is one good example of that. We've seen in a number of countries, particularly that block and filter information, uh, more and more users uh, turning to these technologies to access uh, political websites that are banned within the country. But then what happens often is that then the governments crack down on such tools as well. So then again, it really uh, becomes the game of catch up. And you mentioned in the report something you and I were talking about earlier. What maybe is a little different this year or perhaps becoming more of a problem is governments watching, seeing everyday users, not just activists and journalists, watching their usage. And if you generate enough interest, enough hits, all of a sudden the government comes knocking? Uh, absolutely. So I would say that that's one of the uh, most prevalent trends for this year. In the past, uh, we saw hardcore activists who are fighting for political change being the ones who are arrested because they were using Twitter and Facebook and uh, other tools to promote for positive change. We've also seen courageous journalists being arrested or uh, being attacked. But actually, when it comes to the number of cases, uh, what we are seeing is that, again, now everyday users are being affected. And uh, I, that's creating a huge number of arrests and a huge number of problems. And uh, also, I think it's uh, creating an interesting conundrum for some of the companies that we are talk talking to. Because a few years ago, we would approach some of these companies and we would actually speak with them about the ways how they can uh, make their tools more friendly for activists in the Middle East and elsewhere. And sometimes they would tell, them, tell us quite frankly that their tools are not really meant for activists. Whereas now seeing actually that people are being arrested just for talking about uh, environmental pollution or for you know, complaining about uh, traffic disruptions or you know, what happened in Ukraine, someone uh, you know, posted something about poor parking job, job of a local judge and you know, having police knock on that person's door because of it. I think it's really uh, changing the dynamic here. Just a, a like can get you exactly. in trouble. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Dai, you want to talk a little bit about that and how that is playing out in, in Sudan? Um, actually, uh, what we're seeing in, in Sudan, I'd, I, I'd like to go back to the uh, economic side of things because um, what's, what's very interesting in Sudan is that we're very far from being able to utilize the internet in its entire in its entire uses, especially the economic uses. Internet uh, access in Sudan, for those who don't know, give us an idea how many people ah, are in Sudan. Okay, now? actually, it's 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 interesting because Sudan, in terms of the infrastructure of uh, of the internet, is is one of the best in the region. Uh, during the last decade and a half, the the because there was an oil boom before the separation of South Sudan, it's one of the sectors that has really benefited from that. Uh, the penetration has been rising right right now. It's at 
21% uh, by the end of 2012. Uh, for mobile uh, phones, it's 60%. Um, and uh, the government says that about 88% of the country has coverage of internet. Uh, that's about 800 towns, uh, including one, one struck Darfur, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and that means it's really changing the way, uh, um, uh, the, the way people are using. For instance, the younger generation is mainly accessing the internet on, on handheld devices and smartphones and, and phones right now. Uh, and that's why when you have events in the streets, they are streamed live you know, to the rest of the world. Um, the cost of internet, very affordable, the cheapest in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, in a month, um, uh, you can have unlimited access for two and a half dollars up to three dollars. In a day, it's like 16 cents. So it's, it's very um, accessible to the entire population. Uh, the problem is just a very repressive regime that does not respect the basic freedoms of express, expression, freedom of association, um, peaceful assembly. Um, that's really our problem, not the infrastructure uh, of, of, the, of the telecommunication. What impact is, uh, for example, U.S. sanctions on Sudan? How is that impacting this debate in the sense that some of the technology that might both help the government in terms of uh, taking action against activists and as well as helping activists bypass the government. Tell us how that's affecting I think the entire population suffers from, uh, from the sanctions because part of it does cover the telecommunication tools. Um, uh, simple examples are the inability, for instance, to update um, uh, virus, virus suites or security updates that are automatic. Uh, that cannot be done. Some browsers cannot be updated. Uh, a lot of people are using pirated operating systems, so their computers are constantly crashing. Um, uh, the new technologies like smartphones, for instance, people are unable to buy anything from the iTunes store or, to, or from the Android store uh, because the sanctions are also economic sanctions so nobody has plastic money uh, like Visa, MasterCard to buy anything online um, uh, but even the, the free stuff your phone comes with it when you first buy it but for you to be, to be able to update it or to, to get other new stuff and new applications on the phone you either have to leave the country or someone has to bring that from outside so this is a great limitation for normal citizens because now Nowadays, it's not only activists who are uh, documenting, you know, what's happening. Especially that we, we're on the brink of what, what we, uh, on what we think is is the end of this regime, and as a, uh, and mainly as a result of normal citizen participation, we, we're seeing uh, this year is very different than before because it's not really activists; it's the entire population documenting what's happening in Sudan, um, and access to these basic technologies have given voice to usually people who are apolitical. Um, Jorge, let me pick up on something that we, uh, Asanya, discussed as well, and that's something positive in Mexico in particular, and that is this effort, legislative effort even, to expand access to the Internet in Mexico. That was driven by citizens, largely. This is one of the positives happening here. Talk to us a little bit about that and what difference you think it's going to make. It's very positive because uh, in the past, in the past uh, citizens were not allowed to fill bills to the Mexican Congress, but after a reform in Mexico, uh, it gave the possibility for citizens to, to, to file bills. And a group of citizens, a group of uh, civil society organizations uh, came together to file a bill about the internet access in Mexico. And they suggested uh, a, a lot of things in regards to the internet access. But uh, the most important one was uh, to try to modify the constitution and include a clause saying that the state, the Mexican state, is, uh, is going to warranty the free access to the internet. Uh, those words are a huge success for the civil society organizations. Now, uh, I think they, they have to fight in order to, to have those wording to become a reality mm -hmm. in, in, in Mexico, but um, it, it is indeed a positive thing in, in Mexico. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the new issue that's really come up here in the United States, the surveillance issue. And Ross, I want to get your take on this, because obviously Google's been part of this discussion, uh, thanks to Edward Snowden. How is that changing the debate right now? And how is Google addressing the issue about the companies and the role you all play in terms of the government accessing uh, that information and making those requests of companies like Google? It's changed this debate, and as we saw, the United States in this, in the Freedom House assessment, took a hit this year. Yeah, no, it, it certainly has changed the debate. We, uh, 
at the very beginning of the revelations, we uh, made it very clear, and I, I'm happy to restate this, that we provided no back door, side door, whatever you want to call it, access to the United, the United States government to our servers or our systems in any way. We also uh, needed to make it very clear that we uh, did not respond to any blanket government requests for user data or information. We do, as a U.S. company subject to U.S. law, receive requests from the government uh, for specific pieces of information. And we look at each and every request. Our lawyers look at them very carefully and determine whether or not we comply with that request. Now that's something that I'm actually very proud of because it's incredibly resource intensive to do that. But we recognize how important it is to make sure that each and every request meets the, both the letter and the spirit of the law before we comply. Now, the larger issue, I think, is the effect that this uh, issue, uh, the Snowden affair or, or the PRISM debate, is having around the world on internet freedom. And it's having a profound effect. Uh, I think it really undercuts uh, our ability as a U.S. company and it undercuts the ability of the U.S. government to do the work that we've been doing to promote internet freedom and the role of the internet in advancing uh, communication, economic development, social advancement. Because uh, countries say to us, who are, you to be, who are you to be coming to us and making that argument? Um, it also has provided uh, ammunition for many countries who are looking at places like the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and other UN fora to uh, step in and more heavily regulate and get involved in internet regulation around the world. Um, we're seeing those arguments pick up steam in places like Brazil and in India and other parts of the world uh, where they see the U.S. is too heavily involved in the Internet and they want to free it from that engagement. They want it to be um, more of a global enterprise. And I think, I think some of those arguments are ones that we need to listen to and pay attention to. But I don't think the answer to those concerns is the U.N. stepping in and regulating the Internet. Sonia, you want to weigh in on this and how this has altered the, the debate going forward? Uh, absolutely. It has made it so much more challenging. Uh, I'm Bosnian, and I grew up in a very restrictive environment, so uh, I know that firsthand I have experienced what uh, politically motivated uh, surveillance of telecommunications can be. And uh, it's, it's really interesting, you know, uh, seeing the entire world pointing to the United States. And I think the issues that have been brought up are extremely important and they really have worldwide effect. With that said, it's really unfortunate that, you know, we're seeing then more and more governments then not really wanting to take uh, a look at their own policies because many of them uh, are among the countries that imprison users or where people were killed or that have extremely poor policies. But they're just essentially using the situation in the U.S. as a uh, scapegoat, you know, for their own audiences. Uh, so it, it has definitely made our work uh, much, much more challenging. And again, this is not to undermine uh, what has been uh, happening here in the United Sp States because uh, it is very important uh, to have these discussions. And as you saw in our ratings, the United States has taken uh, a five-point hit on a 100-point scale. But uh, again, we really cannot compare the situation in the United States uh, with some of these uh, places where uh, people were being surveilled and then the information that is being uh, obtained through that surveillance is being then used uh, against them in politicized trials. Peter, could I? Sure. I, I think, you know, we've been thinking a lot about this and I wanted to say that I think one of the ways forward for us is transparency on these issues. And I think that's been, that's been missing. And I, it's not that Google is new to this, to this topic. I, I, I mean, we, we have long published our own transparency report providing uh, the number of government requests for user data, 
how many of those we comply with, and we've been doing that for a number of years, and every year we try and make it more robust. And I do think that transparency is a really powerful tool in this debate. And uh, you know, we're supporting certain legislation in Congress to increase the level of transparency with NSA programs. And I think that that is important work. And I think that it's equally important when you look at these battles around the world as well. We need transparency to figure out what else is going on. Because unless there's understanding about what's really happening, then we can't really have a debate and an argument about this. Uh, it was the same when, when it came to surveillance in, of China, as, as the senator mentioned. You know, we were the first company to go public with the fact that the Chinese had tried to infiltrate our systems. Uh, there were about 30 other companies that were attacked at the same time, yet no one was willing to come forward. You can have a debate or an, an argument about how to solve a problem if you don't even recognize and acknowledge that the problem exists. And it's the same with this surveillance. We can't have a rigorous debate about what is the appropriate balance of security and privacy and access to information if we don't even have the ability to have a discussion with the government about what is really going on. And that's why we've been uh, doing the work that we've been doing, both here in the US and around the world. I want to open it up to questions from the audience. So uh, I want to go to people. I think we've got a question even right there in the back. Hi, if uh, you could identify yourself, please. Uh, Janine Zarnecki. I'm actually a contractor that works for the State Department's Department, uh, Bureau of um, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I have a question about, um, well, because I'm a contractor, I'm always looking for, we, everyone wants our reports, our human rights reports, international religious freedom reports to be beautiful, but I'm always wrestling with the fact that they have to be accessible to those who are on low bandwidth or, and those types of access questions. So I'm, I know that Microsoft has their uh, White Spaces Initiative um, in South Africa. I know Google has something going on as well. So I was more, I was curious about how that program's going, where is it, and how are we getting to those people with no bandwidth or low bandwidth with respect to internet access? Thank you. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really great question. We do have a White Spaces uh, uh, experiment going on in Africa right now. We also have a number of initiatives that we've been working on for a couple of years now. Uh, recognizing that the key to access for most of the world will be mobile devices. I mean, I, I spent a summer in Egypt about 10 years ago, and there was still a two-year wait to get a landline, right? And, and, and what's happened is that places like Egypt have just leapfrogged over that old technology, and now it's all about mobile devices. So we've been working on providing platforms for feature phones with low, low you know, uh, low access, um, low bandwidth, excuse me, uh, to try and provide the same platforms uh, with a different UI and different features uh, to nevertheless enable these folks to participate in the online world to the extent that they can. I think we also really do a lot of, we, we call them moonshots, like our Project Loon. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but you know, we're launching these balloons. It's, a, it's an experiment in New Zealand. They're about, uh, I think, twice the height of a commercial airliner, and they're beaming broadband down to very remote parts of New Zealand. And I think, you is know, it, that's is it the, working? It's, I think it's working pretty well so far. I mean, this is early days, but what's, what's really exciting about that is where this is going to be in a year from now. And I was in Tunisia in northern Africa, and I can tell you that those governments are incredibly aware and excited about this, about the opportunity for using technology like Loon to reach villages and parts of the world that, to be honest, you know, would be, I don't know how many years away from, from getting normal access to, to the net. So uh, we're looking at it and approaching it from many different angles, but we do recognize that access is, from many parts of the world, the key issue here. Can I jump in just a minute? Sure. Would you consider using Loon in a country like Sudan where the government shuts the internet, or would it be considered a violation of that country's sovereignty? Uh, would you have to take permission from countries? I, or know, if people are, by the millions, are standing in the street saying, um, degaj or erhal or leave, is it enough for you to, to give free internet? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a really complicated question because you're talking about 
uh, international airspace when you're doing this, so I, I can't even pretend to know all the various issues to unpack that. But I do know that we are very intent on seeing how Loon goes and looking at other opportunities around the world to, to use it. It's one of the reasons also that we're doing the fiber projects here in the United States. Uh, you know, we're, 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 uh, we've already announced in Provo and Austin and in Kansas City, we have a live project, you know, getting ultra fast broadband to people and what, you know, and really the question is what happens next? We have some idea, but we're using those experiments to learn about the deployment, the usage, with an eye to seeing where else in the world we might be able to, 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 to deploy those networks to get ultra-fast broadband to folks. Let's go over any questions over here. No questions. I'm shocked. It's a problem. Um, let me follow up then. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll get you a microphone, I think, coming over. And if you could introduce yourself, please. Hello, Matthew Howe from the Lifeline program at Freedom House, which is dealing with embattled civil society organizations. Um, you already talked a little bit about the lead that the, the US is having and the effect that other countries are looking at what is happening here and, and making the argument harder. Could you talk a little bit about the trends that you're seeing of, of oppressive governments learning from each other and, um, and, and taking initiatives and, and, and introducing in their own country, and also perhaps how that um, how countries come to you about neighboring countries and their policies and, 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 and make the argument hard to keep the internet open. Is that, your, is that directed at me or Sonia or okay. anyone? Well, Sonia, why don't you start I first? Start. Uh, I can start. So uh, uh, there are two elements of that. One is essentially these oppressive governments obtaining technology from various sources and learning on at that level. So we've seen some of the most oppressive countries, some of the most authoritarian regimes using technology from the West, including the United States, but then also from places such as China, Russia, and elsewhere. Uh, at the same time, we've actually seen uh, China being a very important factor in uh, exporting some of these practices, so I'm not even talking about the technology, but uh, some of the practices that they implement within their own country to other places in the world. We've seen particular effect of that in Africa. So for example, in Ethiopia, just a few years ago, it was the Chinese uh, engineers who actually went to Ethiopia to train the government there on how to institute uh, their filtering system. Uh, we are, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are increasingly seeing some of the surveillance uh, policies that are currently implemented in Russia being then used in other parts of the former Soviet Union, usually the republics that have close relations with Russia. So there is definitely a lot of that bad practice sharing uh, present in the world, and that's precisely the reason why it's really important uh, for the countries that perform well when it comes to internet freedom to really export their practices as well. Daya, anything you want to pick up on that? Is there anything yeah. Sudan's doing because they saw another country doing it? Lots of events, yes. Um, so as of last year, we know that we always knew that there is something called the cyber jihadist unit that existed. Um, so last year, we realized that the government was actually beefing it up in terms of hiring much more people to, to work in that. And it was getting training from countries like Malaysia, India, Iran. Um, so yes, uh, the learning from other countries is, is definitely happening, even with a regime like Sudan that that's new to this surveillance. Um, and the things that this kind of uh, cyber jihadist unit does is um, uh, harass activists on, on Facebook, hack into accounts of Facebook and, and email, and follow very closely online journalists um, who only publish online. But then when they get arrested, they see that their entire dossier is full of articles they've written or um, Facebook posts that they get questioned about. Um, so yes, even a country like Sudan is, is not very sophisticated as, as like Iran, for instance, but it is definitely learning and asking for assistance uh, on issues like this. Jorge, anything you can add to it from your experience? Um, yes, I think um, in the in the Freedom on the Net report in regards to Mexico, in the Mexico chapter, there is um, some, some uh, paragraphs dedicated to the experience of the U.S. government providing help to the Mexican government to buy uh, surveillance tools, equipment, and software. Uh, uh, these equipment were delivered to the Mexican military and the, the software and the equipment were able, is able to, to 
to, to track uh, conversation, conversations among telephones. Uh, it is able to track information from mobile devices, um, iPhones, um, Galaxies, Samsung, whatever. And uh, th this is uh, uh, this is now uh, um, a military capability. So I think uh, it's quite important to understand that uh, the the binational relationship between the, the the U.S. and Mexico has to pass through uh, scrutiny and um, check balance and um, and because um, we can have the risk of having Mexican officers officers trained in. Uh, digital and mobile uh, surveillance by by the U.S., but it, it is a, it is a possibility. So um, I think um, in the Mexican con in the U.S. Congress, in the debates about about the, the danger of um, invading privacy of the citizens, this should be included in the conversation in the debate. One thing that caught my attention in this year's report, as well as last year's, as a journalist, are the people who are paid by the government to go way in online, these outside commentators who are getting a paycheck. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that and the, and the rise of that. I, I probably know some people who would be candidates for that in this country, but uh, let's not name names. But. That's right. So uh, one of the things that we have noticed uh, over the past few years is actually the rise in these uh, paid pro-government commentators. And it's really interesting because these are actually individuals that are being hired by the governments covertly by using public funds to then uh, go to message boards or go to Twitter or, or blogs and essentially spread propaganda. Uh, what they also do is they actually defame and try to uh, damage the reputation of prominent human rights organizations or opposition politicians. And again, uh, they're doing this in such uh, an uh, orchestrated way that it becomes very difficult for users uh, to recognize it. So some examples that we've seen uh, from places like Russia is, for example, if you would have uh, a prominent human rights defender saying something, you know, um, we have uncovered evidence in corru of corruption, you know, in this town, then you would have a series of messages that are, again, very well coordinated, where, you know, the first message would say, oh, uh, I'm, I would not really trust this person because haven't you heard that last week he was actually you know, tried and he's in court for sp spreading lies? And then the other person would say, uh, oh yeah, I've actually heard about it. And then you have a series of messages like that. So then if you're just a reader reading this blog and then you, s you hear and you see the post made by you know, this uh, independent news source and then you see a whole set of messages essentially uh, questioning the credibility of the source, then you start thinking, oh, maybe the source is really not that credible. I'm not going to believe it. Uh, and this is really a challenge because uh, activists and bloggers just are not really sure how to deal uh, with it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. So we've seen uh, this phenomenon uh, being started in China some years ago with the so-called 50 cent party where the government would pay 50 cents for each of the uh, posts being uh, posted in such way. But then we've also seen this uh, being spread to places like Bahrain uh, and uh, Russia, and then in most more recent years in places like Malaysia even, or Ecuador and so forth. I know we've got another question over here. Thank you. My name is Marina Kalurant. I'm Estonian ambassador. And I would like to congratulate Freedom House on the report. And we are the country that is number two, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but we were, we were number one for three years in a row. But we are not complaining. <laughs> we are really happy to lose to Iceland. <laughs> and we are happy to lose to anybody who will be doing better. So I, I think that all the countries that have improved their position and all the countries who are paying attention should be congratulated. I would like to, to, I would like to raise the point that was very rightly mentioned by Ross. It's the triangle. Privacy, security, uh, in, freedom of information. What's the suggestion of your panel to a government like mine which is very internet supportive, very concrete, uh, concrete suggestions how we should act, what should we do, and what should we pay more attention to. Thank you. Go ahead. I have one, one, one suggestion is um, we, are, we are building a, a platform in Mexico to map crime and corruption. Uh, we started to map 
attacks to journalists. But the point is that sometimes we think that the platform, the online platform, can be cyber attacked. So uh, in doing investigation, we found that um, the top countries, in terms of freedom of the net, can help hosting websites uh, and to protect them. Uh, I think this is can, a possibility. So this is a platform, a website for journalists, but you're suggesting yeah. if the government is there to, to back it up. To, to, to host the website. Mm -hmm. Dai, you want to offer Actually, any thoughts? I, I, w I would like to second that because in Sudan right now there is a trend where the newspapers that are bound on uh, offline are going online, but a lot of them are hacked uh, or even bought completely down if they are if the server is inside the country. So most of the new ones uh, have servers either in the UK, in France, or in the US, um, and uh, this is an. The other thing for a country like uh, like Sudan, where most of the people inside cannot pay with plastic money for, is free governments like that giving us this service for free, actually, because we cannot pay for it online. Uh, and and that, that would benefit a lot of online journalism um, to be more prolific, because at the moment we have like maybe a handful only of online newspapers that are popular. And I think what's limiting more is the lack of accessibility uh, and the lack of ability to pay for services, since we can't pay for anything online. We've uh, got a question here, and then I think we're going to have to wrap it up after that, sir. Uh, my name is Jim Chen. I'm a founder of China Reporters Foundation to promote press freedom in China. Um, I was a journalist there. I was the state-owned China uh, Radio International, and then based in Africa. So I, I witnessed the uh, censorship. And my question for our <laughs> representative from um, uh, Google, and uh, you, uh, I really admire your courage to uh, stand alone against censorship uh, in China by the Chinese government and uh, pull out of the market as the biggest now so far. They have about 500 million internet users and nearly um, uh, 80 or 90 percent of them use smartphone. And so what, I, even today, and Google I think has the obligation to promote as what you're doing today and uh, press freedom uh, in the world. So what are we going to do about that big internet population. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for the question. I, I actually have a very unique perspective on it because I was uh, head of government affairs in Asia and they sent me out there to to deal with the China situation in the beginning of uh, 2010 so I spent about three years there and I've just come back. The, one of the things that we're doing is we, we didn't really leave China. We, we are still there. We have a number of engineers. We have an office in Shanghai and an office in Beijing. All we did was <clears throat> we made a decision uh, precipitated by uh, the government attempts to access our systems that we would no longer cooperate in the Chinese uh, system of censorship, which was multi-layered. You had the 50 cent army sort of gently leading debate, you know, oh, what about corruption in, in Harbin? And then someone would say, oh, but the government services are so good. So you gently move the conversation to a safe topic uh, to all the way to the technology they employed to uh, filter content. But a key part of that system remains company cooperation with the government. Seen right. Because as even though the Great Wall, uh, the, uh, the firewall, the Great Firewall, is, is gotten much, much better over the years, it's still a very rough and rudimentary piece of technology. And it cannot keep up with the 500 million users online. It can't keep up with all the things the government wants to censor. So what the government does is they give each company a blacklist every so often. And it's up to the company to filter their own results and, and take that material off their sites. You know, a government official's son hits a, hits a pedestrian with his Range Rover. The next day, the blacklist includes Range Rover, the name of the street, the name of the government official, the name of the town. Um, and they can't update the firewall quickly enough, so they rely on companies to do it. So what we did in January 2010 is say, we're just not going to do that anymore. 
we're not going to accept that blacklist, we're not going to cooperate in this system. But we also, importantly, did not say, and we're leaving China, because we feel uh, we want to be a part of that, uh, of that market. We hope to be a part of that market. But we also recognize that we have a responsibility to those users in China to try and make a difference, to try and engage, to stay there. I, I'm not saying that that's going extremely well, uh, but one of the reasons we're there is because we recognize our responsibility to our Chinese users to stay and engage. I'm going to give uh, Sonia the final word here because we, we've reached uh, the end of our allotted time. You said at the, in your presentation the history of I the internet, history of internet freedom being written right now, critical juncture. Do you have a final message for those people in the audience, perhaps those listening uh, over the internet and, and able to see this later? Uh, absolutely. As I mentioned, that uh, until a few years ago, very few countries had laws uh, pertinent specifically to ICTs and the internet. Those laws are being written as we speak. Uh, a number of countries around the world actually have proposals on the table that can negatively impact internet freedom. So then from that perspective, is, it's extremely important that we support activists on the ground, that we act, that we apply international pressure uh, in order to prevent further internet deterioration. All right, Sonia, Jorge, Dahlia, Ross, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you to the audience. Thank you, Peter. Those of you uh, listening, remember you can get the Freedom House report online. I suggest you do it. It's a thousand pages, but worth the reading, particularly if you're looking for individual countries. Thank you all again. Thanks to Google and Freedom House for hosting this, and uh, thanks for coming.